Hi, I'm Brent, and welcome to my language channel. Here, as you might guess, I, I talk about languages, particularly my progress in, in Mandarin Chinese. I've been sort of inspired by the people in the Refold Discord to do something like this. I've been learning Chinese for about, I want to say 16 months at this point, although it's, it's not all been Refold. I, I was thinking, what's the best way to format this? There's, there's one way. I, I could just sit here, look at the camera. You can look at this beautiful background and I can just talk about my experiences. But I wanted to make this a bit more visual, sort of engage through the, the visual medium. So I came up with this idea and I found this website here. We'll, we'll shift you over called time.graphics, which allows me to completely for free basically make this timeline where what I've done here is I've went back in time. I've looked at my billing history. I've looked at video date uploads, all, all these different factors. And I came up with, with this timeline here. And it's based all on, for the most part, very, very specific dates. It's all absolutely accurate. And it breaks up my Mandarin study into four different epochs. And an epoch can be thought of as a period in time, which has a definitive start date and a definitive end date. So there's epoch one, epoch two, epoch three, and epoch four, but don't worry, we'll get to those later. So I said I've been studying for about 16 months. Let's take you way back to the beginning. I was a, a final year student at a university. My partner is Chinese, they speak Mandarin. And I'd been dating them for I think about 18 months at this point, and I thought, it would be pretty cool to speak Chinese, right? It's like, it's atypical, it's, it's useful, could be good for personal development, all these different factors. And so I had an elective spot. I enrolled in a, a two-term course. So you see first semester here and second semester. That, that's pretty typical of language courses. So I enrolled, and this marks the beginning of Epoch 1, as we'll call it, casual good student. So. The semester began and we were taught Pinyin, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's sort of the romanization of Mandarin. It takes the IPA and then superimposes Chinese phonemes upon that. And it's much, much easier to, to type with, obviously. You can't actually type tens of thousands of characters. <laughs> it's, it's not that feasible. And I think that's actually why Pinyin was, was developed once upon a time. But really what it does is it helps people coming from, from non-Asian languages, but really just not Japanese, learn, learn the Hanzu, which for those of you who are coming from the, the Japan server, which a lot of you probably are, it's sort of like that's their, our, our kanji basically, except the entire language is, is kanji. You can think about it that way. So I began first semester, learned pinyin. This here, I, I found, is what an average lecture was like outside of the first one. The professor, very nice lady, would sit up at the front of the room and basically teach us some characters, teach us the, the pinyin, and then run through sentence formats, all these different things. We would have this, this great exercise where we would we would take what we learned and then speak with the, the equally uninformed learner beside us. And then we would, we'd all early output together and great learning experience. But uh, I'll get into the root of my pessimism later. So anyways, I actually enjoyed this. It gave me something of a structure at the beginning that I think is important for learners. But I quickly noticed, so September into... To October, I quickly noticed that I was I was surpassing, or, or I wanted to surpass what the class was teaching. We were learning about fifteen characters a week, maybe, because again, the goal of the course not again, rather the, the first time I'm introducing this. The goal of the course was to learn two hundred and fifty to three hundred characters. So that was the goal for the first term, and that gets you to HSK two on the two point system, which is sort of like very, very basic level. And the HSK system, don't need to get into the Chinese, which it stands for, but it's, it's a way of evaluating Chinese. Every language has it. I'm sure you can sort of intuit what I mean. So I thought, 
I would like to, to do more with my study. I'm enjoying Chinese. What do I do? And so I, I stumbled upon Duolingo. And I very quickly left Duolingo, probably within a couple of days. After doing some research online, I think I stumbled upon, I want to say Lamont's video from days of, I think it's Swedish and French or days of French and Swedish, where he had done French. He had a, a Duolingo streak that went on for like four or three years. And he, he didn't have that positive th of things to say about it. And I, I was very cognizant of not ending up like that. So instead what I did, marking the beginning of Epoch 2, dedicated but misguided, I began something called Nin Chinese. And this is Nin Chinese here. Nin Chinese is a gamified system for learning Chinese. It breaks Chinese up into, into worlds primarily, but there are... But there are different worlds assigned to different things, but what I focused on was, again, the HSK system. They have six different worlds, I guess seven, because the later ones are broken up into multiple. And I did up until HSK3. And what's cool about this and what motivated me, there's an experience system. You get put onto a leaderboard. You can add friends. Again, very gamified. You'd be introduced to grammar, or, or vocabulary, rather, about 10 Per, per lesson unit, whatever you want to call this. You'd SRS it within the lesson. It would be added to, to this here, which is sort of a, a broader SRS. They would have grammar exercises where you would take all the different characters and sort of configure them into a, a proper formation. So sentence order, stuff like that. They actually had, to their credit, pretty good grammar exercises. And pretty good explanations as well and then they had a speaking portion where you would and perhaps i can show you one here so they had a story that went through all of it and that's what you'll see here so basically how it worked is this would move along it has it has voice recognition so you would speak into your mic and with probably like 98 percent accuracy it would get what you're saying so you would say ni hao, and then wo jiao, ni cha, and then, then you, you go on. And it's a conversation, you do both sides. And I guess the idea is it gives you speaking practice. It doesn't necessarily mesh with refold ideology now, and I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily repeat this were I to do it from the beginning. But if you're watching this and you're, you're beginning Chinese and you're looking for some sort of structure, I, I actually would recommend in Chinese. It sort of gives you that additional push that maybe maybe RTH won't give you, which we'll, we'll get into later. But anyways, I'm doing Nin Chinese. I do that for like a month or so. And then I stumble upon this podcast, the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. And it's not a podcast that focuses so much on the the linguistic aspects of chinese but rather the pedagogical aspects of learning chinese which means like how you actually learn the language the mechanics and something they talked a lot about was Krashen's idea of of comprehensible input this idea that you can have a book but the best book for you will be the book that that has around two or one percent unknown words but that's difficult, right? It's like at the beginning in particular, how do you find a book that's right at your level? And the answer is graded readers. And so these people here, in the You Can Learn Chinese podcast, created Mandarin Companion, and these guys here actually, Jared and, and John, a great podcast too, especially if you're beginning Chinese. They created books based upon based upon the English corpus, you can sort of think of it that way. It's like books that were popular in English literature, translated into Chinese and sort of Chineseified, where they, they take place in China, they use more Chinese cultural set pieces, etc. Like Sherlock Holmes is an example. You could probably recognize a bunch of these if you, if you looked through them, Journey to the Center of the Earth. And then they have three levels. They have Breakthrough, Level 1, Level 2, and these roughly correspond to again HSK1, HSK2, and HSK3, although not perfectly, it's, it's a bit more complicated because certain series or, or certain, certain stories rather, sorry, 
use different like journey to the center of the earth for example you need different vocabulary here maybe in reference to geology that you wouldn't in i don't know my, my teacher is a martian let's say so while it it roughly follows the hsk system there's a bit of deviation and again highly recommend these i i began with my teacher as a martian and in fact just before that after sort of studying in chinese and and taking the course and, and listening to the podcast i got quite quite interested in chinese and i thought you know what i see the way the world is going and irrespective of what i do because i'm graduating how would i take a year and i go study in china Right, the, the common sense explanation for how you learn a language is you take classes and then the big one you hear is you go to that, that country and you immerse. And so I thought, following common sense, how would I go to China? I do some sort of study abroad program at some Chinese university and then I study there. Seems like it could be a rich experience, there's a bunch of scholarships and stuff that can can fully fund your time there and so this was the first time sort of to, to set the scene for my mindset where i i emailed my teacher asking about this and that's december 13th so i was chugging along i think i had my my chinese exam on december 11th so i finished that i had some time in the break i read this book and i did whatever else i did in that break and then come the end of the the second term or the first term, sorry. I thought, you know what? I'm reading, I'm a real champ, I'm reading 150 characters. Look at me go. You know what I can't do? I can't speak. So, a little bit into the second term where I was supposed to be learning 500 characters, I went on italki. And I got a once weekly tutor for, I guess, five weeks here. And to their credit, they were they were nice. It's just they were dealing with a person who was not even not even slightly close to being at a point where they could help. But I was basically just translating and then asking them how to literally translate my thoughts. And after this, I I decided not to resume as it just wasn't useful. I mean, it's not expensive per se, but it just wasn't a good use of my time. I had a bunch of other classes here. I was doing, doing my, my senior thesis. But what I, I did, in fact, continue is I jumped from breakthrough level, so sort of HSK 1, 150 characters, to level 2, or level 1 here, so HSK 2, but 300 characters. And that was the Prince and the Pauper, and I kept on going, taking this course, jumped to another one, level 1, the 60 year dream jumped to Sherlock Holmes and as the the term progressed I was learning more and more characters doing nin Chinese and, and in fact at this point I was already past by the time I would go to lecture I already knew all of the characters that I was was learning the, the 15 or so just from my my other experiences in nin Chinese and reading so while I attended lecture and I, I performed well it, it was sort of a bit of a waste of time at this point it was more of just going back and reviewing what I had learned and it got a bit messy at this point too I won't go into it too much because the school honestly dealt with it quite well but this professor here the one I liked decided that she wasn't going to notify the school and she was going to bring in another professor to take her job basically again not notifying the school in that the person who came in taking her job for the third time not notifying the school couldn't really speak english that well and so she basically just stood at the front sort of yelling at us in chinese and it was a real mess and what basically ended up happening because credit to the school because it was such a mess and they felt so bad that they'd wasted so many people's time at the end here they ended up paying for my entire nin chinese subscription because this basically supplemented the education I wasn't getting for the course I was paying for. But uh, I'll move on because it, it's not worth dwelling on. But I'm a bit... My, my opinions of classes are a bit soured by that experience, I would say. 
But moving on anyways, somewhere around here, I, I don't know specifically, I discovered Xiaoma, the, the polyglot extraordinaire on YouTube. And he, probably around here to be honest, which is why I started getting italki tutors. And respect to him for his niche, but I, I think he gave me the wrong idea of how you acquire a language. In, in particular, the, the timeline that you can reasonably expect. But what ended up coming from this, and thankfully so, is Xiaoma posted that very, the, the no, I guess, famous and infamous, I don't know what the right word to use is, video with Matt, the VR chat one, the one I think a lot of you guys found his channel through. And I also found his, his channel through that. One thing that jumped out to Matt, or jumped out about Matt rather from the beginning, was one, he wasn't a YouTube polyglot, thank goodness. And two, he wasn't trying to sell me a course. All the information that he was trying to provide me was free. And I very quickly subscribed on Patreon. Over the course of probably like three weeks, I, I binged 75% of his public library and then maybe half of his. His Q and A's. I was I was hooked at at that point. It made sense, and it was like it, my mind exploded, and there was an epiphany somewhere in there, and it was a great experience. And then so that was April eighth. Come April twelfth, so literally four days later, I started watching a drama, and in retrospect, I, I probably picked one of the worst dramas I could. It was a historical piece set in preceding the the Qin dynasty so the what like the the fragmented kingdoms period i forgot the specific name where there's a bunch of little dynasties competing and then they all sort of unite and for those of you who are unfamiliar with chinese everybody would use mandarin in that that context they wouldn't at the time but they would sort of place it in there but they they throw in old language and old ways of speaking to set the mood and I, I obviously couldn't differentiate those at the time, so really what ended up happening is <laughs> I'd have my Chinese subtitles, I would try and read, and then about 99% of the time I would fail, so I would just jump to, to English. And I persevered, I guess, to my credit, but I don't know how much it helped. So chugging along, I jump from level 1 to level 2, sort of before this, and then start crushing these exam period here graduate university here write my senior thesis uh tough period here so not not a ton of chinese to be honest and then i, I do some in chinese after graduating because obviously i have a, a bunch of time at that point although covid hit somewhere around here and any plans of studying in china were sort of dashed I could no longer do that reasonably, although I didn't know how severe the pandemic was. I sort of intuitively know, knew that I wouldn't be able to go. And so chugging along, do Nin Chinese, I read this book. And the interesting point here, and this sort of marks the beginning of Epoch 3, I had finished, because Jekyll and Hyde wasn't out at the time, I had finished all of the level 2 books. And so this was, was sort of the, the crutch holding me as I, I moved along. It gave me the confidence to move on. And I, I no longer had that. And then I started wondering, it's like, well, what the heck am I supposed to be doing? I'm watching dramas, perhaps. I think I may be watching like one of these for day, per day. So it's still going on here. Doing in Chinese, but I'm not really progressing. Because I'd been studying for, I don't know, like nine months at this point eight months and i i could read a 600 character graded reader but as for how much i actually knew i could recognize those characters i didn't really understand them i had learned them but i don't know if i had acquired them per se and so i started leaning a lot more heavily into at the time mia the mass immersion approach and what I did at this point, and this marks the beginning of Epoch 3, guided but lacking refinement, I cut in Chinese. I obviously stopped the graded readers because there weren't any more. And then I started, I started RTH, 
remembering the hunt. So in the, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's basically it's a system where you create mnemonics for characters such that you're able to recognize them and make very salient mental dictionary entries. I did this, not really understanding Anki. Sorry, I'm going to turn off my heater. Oh, a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> Anyways, not really understanding Anki. I, I did 30 new cards per day. And at the beginning, it was manageable, obviously, because you haven't built up a, a bank yet of, of review cards. And I'm going to fourth screen this, actually. And it very quickly got absolutely brutal. At the peak, I think I was probably spending like four hours per day doing RTH. And right here, and then I'll come back to this point, I burnt out hard. I burnt out really hard. This is the only point I, I can say, I guess somewhat proudly, it's the only point where I haven't studied Chinese at all some days. And I call this the study gap. What ended up happening here is I, I like video games, but throughout my entire undergrad, trying to maintain a, a strong GPA, doing a whole bunch of extracurriculars in, in TAing, so being a teaching assistant for, for some courses, it sucked up all my time. I had absolutely zero time to play video games, so I sort of had to, to put those on hold for a couple of years. And I had just graduated, I had some, some free time, so I ended up playing Dragon Quest. For those of you who are familiar in the, the Japanese community, you can probably see quite clearly how this could suck up about two weeks of your life. And at the beginning I was doing my reviews, but probably like for a week I didn't do anything. And it, it was a waste of time maybe, but it sort of... It gave me perspective. It allowed me to, to step back and get back on the horse. And I, I did precisely that. I, I continued RTH. I probably ended up doing like 1,400 characters in total. But to maybe rewind a bit and set the... Give you context into my mindset going forward because I had graduated and I was basically studying full-time at this point except for an online set-your-own-hours position that I, I occupied and currently occupy in fact it probably takes like two two hours per day I started thinking so it's like I'm learning Chinese I can't go study in China right now China is a a country that whether people like it or not is going to be relevant over the next coming decades and I need to do some sort of graduate program. So I thought, what could I do? And then international business came to mind. I ended up finding an international business program that I was qualified for, a relatively good school. And they have a, a cool program that, assuming sort of bilinguality, which bilinguality upon graduating, sorry, they would send you on exchange to a, a sort of list of schools that they have available as exchange partners. So I do half my, my degree, or maybe a quarter of my degree in Canada, because I'm Canadian, I do all the other Canadians, do about another quarter in a developing nation, so at a, a firm, maybe Vietnam, if everything works out. And then I do another half specifically in China, in Beijing, at a, a relatively good school. And it's it's a very rich opportunity, and that's sort of it, it colors everything. I'm in the final stages of interviewing, and it looks like it it may work out, but fingers crossed. I don't want to jinx it on the internet. And so, sorry, this sort of to bring a long winded rant back into back into a more concise state. I was going to do this masters, and by the time I graduated about two and a half years from now, maybe two years from now, I need to be able to speak fluent Chinese as they describe it, whatever fluent means. I, I don't honestly really know what that means anymore. But so I'm studying full time in, in pursuit of that goal. So RTH, somewhere around here, I start doing spoon fed Chinese. For those of you who are familiar, it's in there's a pre-made Anki deck with a whole bunch of sentence cards. I experimented with Morph Man, 
which basically try and find I plus one or one T sentences. I didn't really like it. So as recommended by MIA, I just started creating. Excuse me. I started creating sentence cards. So right here, made my first sentence card. I I started watching dramas more consistently. And maybe and I guess worth also mentioning, I was creating more than 20 new sentence cards per day and doing 20 new sentence cards per day. So at this point I was maybe spending like an hour, hour and a half. Actually no no no, sorry. So the beginning of this I was still doing RTH. Here I was doing like three hours per day of Anki still. Because I was doing RTH, I think about 15 new cards per day, and then 20 new sentence cards. But around here, I think the end of July, roughly, I ended up dropping RTH and just focusing on dramas and sentence cards. And now here, this is sort of like the second part of Epoch 3 guided but re unrefined or, or lacking refinement, I guess is how I phrased it. I may call it the question mark period because while, while I was theoretically studying full time, and if you asked me at the time how much I was studying, I would have said something like maybe nine, 10 hours per day. I wasn't. I was maybe like peaking out or capping out at four, five hours per day on a good day. I'd watch, I would watch three dramas per day on a good day and then do my Anki card. So maybe about four hours. And the issue was, honestly, while I knew what to do, I lacked the structure to implement discipline into my life. And so I continued this, continued along, making progress, honestly, definitely making progress, but relative to the amount of time I had available, not making the progress that I needed. And then this happened. MIA sort of fell apart, don't need to go into that. Matt and Ethan ended up launching Refold, the, the Discord. I joined. Soon after, Refold ended up launching the Hanyu server, which is their, their Mandarin server. And I, I applied to be a moderator. In being a moderator, I ended up getting, and I currently am in fact, and <laughs> come join us there. We have a good community of people. Yeah, shilling for, for Refold here. Come join us. We have a great community. And this sort of pulled me in. And I saw that other people were making videos like this. Other people were were tracking, granted, maybe not at the same obsessiveness that you're you're about to see for me. But on December 7th, I started tracking my immersion. December 8th, after tracking, I realized that it was time to step up my game and I started reading. Now, remember, this was the last time that I had read a book and this was a graded reader. That was what, May 11th. December 8th, I started reading The Hunger Games in Chinese. It was a book I had read when I was younger, a series rather, that I'd read when I was younger. I have seen the movies, not recently, but. I knew sort of the general context of the story. I figured that would help. It would help inform my my insufficiencies or help bolster my my ability to read. And it really did. Like I, I developed rapidly, incredibly rapidly over this period. Reading, I'm about to finish, in fact, the, the third book. I'm averaging a book about every two weeks at this point which I, I'm pretty proud of myself for doing. But again, to sort before I bring you into tracking immersion, just know that tracking is the beginning of Epoch 4, guided and refined. So it gave me that structure that I didn't previously have. It gave me both the, the confidence and the discipline to start averaging nine hours per day. And that sounds wild, but when you're studying full time and taking this period out of your life, it's like you better be studying that long, or at least that's my mindset. Don't let my, my perhaps toxic beliefs rub off on you. So this is how I, I track. There, to give you context perhaps, there are a couple of different types of activities that I can be doing. 
So active watching is just watching anything either intensive or free flow, although they've sort of converged at this point. Active reading is pretty intuitive, just reading a book. Active learning is basically just Anki, any sort of grammar work I do, which I haven't really done yet. Although I suspect I probably will do more of that once I start outputting. Um, passive immersion here, two different categories, which I'll explain later. Passive immersion is basically, I'm cooking, uh, I'm eating, I have these bad boys on, and I'm just listening. So let's say at the beginning of the day, I start a show at... 1230 which is probably a reasonable time given that I have the job I'm working in the morning which I probably put in like two th probably about two hours is the most honest evaluation so I put in two hours in the beginning get ready in the morning start this and then maybe I, I end at uh, 13 so 120 50 minutes was calculated it's brought down to active watching and then something called interim waste is started to it begins to be calculated. And how this is calculated, I have show two, but let's say I take a 10 minute break and then start at 1.30. You'll notice that a 10 minute gap was calculated between here, and that's called interim waste. It's sort of a metric of procrastination, is how I like to think about it. It's imperfect, and the reason there are two different types of passive immersion, passive immersion during a study is this period so when i begin doing my study to the end so i don't know like maybe like 10 30 is a reasonable time that i might end each day just straight through i don't know like 10 30 22 30 and then that's there all the ways to be calculated and then that would be subtracted against passive immersion during study. So again, passive immersion during this period would be subtracted against this. And it gives me a metric of time through here that I could have spent passive immersing that I didn't. So time wasted, time wasted to procrastination or, or whatever you want to call it. It's imperfect because obviously sometimes I need to go out and do other things. Like I don't really have much of a life due to the pandemic where we're basically on complete lockdown orders, so I can't really do anything. Although I live with my girlfriend, so we we spend some time together. But anyways, I'm going on a rant. And then, or sorry, I'm going on a tangent. And then after study is just basically anything before or anything after, so it doesn't taint this metric. And this here is brought into the archive, as I call it. So I have every single day using collapsible collapsible rows in Excel. And then this day is brought into the summary column. So I have December and then January. And I'll show you January. So here are all the metrics. You have active watching, active reading, listening, passive immersion, the total, time waste calculated for the day. And I only started calculating that on the fourth. And you'll notice it's actually sort of gone down over time. The amount of characters in a book I read per day, along with the, the reading speed, which is basically just a metric, taking this and then dividing it by the amount of time I spend reading. And then the improvement across days, so this versus this, the improvement. The amount of cards I do in Anki per the day, or per day, rather. And then median scores, mean scores, total, and then share, the amount I spend per activity. And then there's an all-time summary here, which is basically, it's less useful now because I only have like a month and a half, but over time, the, the all-time summary is going to, to be neat. But anyways, this has been helpful. This has been, it's hard to, or it's difficult to articulate how helpful tracking has actually been. Given the same amount of free time each day, I basically went from doing four hours of immersion, just total immersion, uh, active watching, active reading, act active listening, and passive immersion, to doing, now I'm averaging like nine, what was it actually, I think I closed it or, or not. <sighs> For this month, oh no, I'm hyping myself up too much, averaging about nine hours and ten minutes, with a median of about nine hours and twenty minutes. 
So I've more than doubled my efficiency, the amount of time I'm spending per day, given the same amount of free time. Start tracking. I tell everybody in the Chinese Discord, and a couple people have actually started, and they report basically the same thing that I have. Not quite as dramatic because a lot of people aren't studying full time, and it's more of more of like a hobby sort of thing, which good for them. That's awesome. And they've noticed that they're wasting less time more generally. And some people have even applied this system outside of language learning to school, to work, etc. And it's just it's sort of a, a general life hack. But anyways, I'll, I'll move on now. Here I created the YouTube channel and yesterday actually, January 14th, so I'm recording this on the 15th of 2021. Yesterday, I dropped subtitles for my immersion. And boy, did that humble me. I went from like a level five comprehension using Refold's comprehension index with subtitles to like maybe a three for again, a slice of, a slice of life show. I expect this to improve over time, but the reason I, I did this so dramatically is because at the beginning of July is a very tentative date. I want to transition to stage three to start outputting. Because at this point, and I don't have it marked down, if everything works out, and again, fingers crossed, um, I'll be entering the program in early, early January. And at this point, I would like to be able to speak conversational Mandarin. And then by the time I graduate, which is a 16 month program, so like, I don't know, mid 2023. I'd like to be able to to speak about basically anything I need outside of very esoteric domains. And there are esoteric domains that I actually want to be able to output in. In fact, when I go to, to China, if everything works out, I'm going to have the option of either taking English classes at the university or Chinese classes. And <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm going to look back on this and just laugh at myself hard and, and think I'm a bit too arrogant, but I, I would like to, in I guess 20 months from now, be able to take business classes at a strong university in China, in Chinese. That's my goal. I'm putting this out into the world. I, I now have some pressure on me. So I'll do my best to, to meet that goal and update you guys over time. Which I guess that actually brings me into, into the final bit, how I'm going to update you guys over time. And the plan is uh, I'll probably keep this updated, so sort of milestones worth, worth updating. And again, this is time.graphics if you guys want to, to use it for yourself. I'll update this, but really what I'm probably going to end up committing to are once monthly update videos where I discuss experience, breakthroughs, etc. I don't know if I consider myself a YouTuber, although I guess by making this by by definition I'm a YouTuber. But this is more in the reason it's called Brent's language journal, not Chinese journal, is because this is quite selfishly more just for me. I'm sharing this because I think other people will find it useful. But this really is for me to look back on and have a good laugh at myself. And if people ask me in, in like, I don't know, five years time, how I learned Chinese, I don't want to just say that I watched a bunch of Chinese media. I'd like to be able to refer them to this so they can, they can see what I, I actually went through. And this is what I went through. This is the big recap video of my experience about 16, 17 months learning Chinese. And I guess in reflection, because I'm nearing the end of stage 2C in Refold in 16 months, I'm almost certain doing this from the beginning in Chinese, if somebody knew what they were doing and didn't waste their time in these classes or doing Nin Chinese, or not that Nin Chinese is a waste of time, but it's just not that efficient, this could 100% be done in half the time. Because basically all of the progress that I can, that I've noticed in my Chinese can be attributed to immersion learning. 
I went from not being able to understand like a, a three character sentence. Like, I don't know, somebody could tell me, which is like, what is your name previously here? Despite knowing 600 characters and, and I'd have absolutely no idea. I, I really would have no idea what they were even saying. And th that was troublesome. And I think it, not to, to poo poo on typical education so much, but, or traditional education rather, but <laughs> get immersing if you're watching this. If you don't know what refold is, you should. Go to refold, R E F O L D dot L A. Come join the Discord and just get immersing. Yeah, I think that's a good way to end it. Get immersing. Stop wasting time, start tracking, and, and work towards being a better version of yourself. Take care and see you on the Discord and see you in, in a month or so.